out as well that is uh, making things very difficult for sectional title complexes and hopefully we can uh, we can shed some light on 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 that uh, for the moment <clears throat> um okay the first and the most important thing that i want uh, to stress today is that permission given by trustees does not override the provisions of any town planning scheme any national building or the national building regulations sectional title act the sectional title schemes management act or any of the prescribed rules that exist for um for sectional title units even duets fall into the same category so whenever you uh, are asked for permission it should always read something like the trustees have in principle no objection to additions or alterations on condition that the provisions of the town planning scheme the national building regulation sectional title act sectional title schemes act and prescribed rules are adhered to by doing that you set the tone for a uh, owner to know that the permission that you are given is conditional unfortunately owners take permission from trustees as the do or be all and they immediately believe that they have the right to do the alteration or the addition and that is the cause of so many misunderstandings and problems that is created uh, and trustees do it with the best intention not understanding the consequences of not following all of these uh, provisions of the different rules and, and regulations as we refer to now the documentation that needs to be adhered to include the zoning zoning basically refer to the rights on the property uh, how many units are allowed how many uh, what percentage of area can be roofed the height of the building uh, parking requirements all of those things come from the zoning of the property and therefore it is of utmost importance that uh, a managing agent as well as the body corporate have a copy of the zoning certificate because that is uh, part of one needs when you uh look at uh, approving additions and alterations uh this is from the uh, pretoria town planning scheme the Tswane town planning scheme basically and um, normally the complexes will be zoned residential two and with that there is a standard set of rules that one needs to adhere to uh, if there's no uh, schedule to it it will refer to schedule four in Tswane and it will give you coverage typically 40% uh, it can be different so you cannot take that as a given you need to get the information for your specific complex uh, it refers to the need for a site development plan and it referred to parking requirements um, coverage as you all might know is a very important issue in complexes and it just means the percentage area of a property including servitudes covered by roofed areas uh, if you look at it vertically from 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 the top the only exclusion is roof overhangs but if you have a property of 10,000 square meters you are allowed roofed areas of 4,000 square meters. The problem comes in that developers typically would use as much of that coverage possible when they develop the complex. And therefore, there might not be a lot of additional coverage left 
once uh, the new uh, complex has been built. And therefore, all additions to it must be measured on the availability of coverage. But we, we will have a look at that a bit later. Then parking is a very important issue as well and create lots of issues in uh, complexes. Uh, the standard requirements would be one or two parking bays per unit. And then uh, with that, you need to provide one parking space for all for three dwelling units for visitors. And those parking requirements is, uh, is legally required. And it's not up to the uh, decision of trustees whether one allows that parking to be used for, for anything else. Um, the three types of plans that we need or that uh, is uh, play a part in uh, sectional title units in complexes. Firstly is the site development plan in terms of the town planning scheme. Uh, we will look at that in more detail. Then of course, building plans in terms of the national building regulations. And then thirdly, the one that we all know about the sectional title plans in terms of the sectional title act. The myth that if you have sectional title plans, you don't need building plans is exactly a myth. You need all of these plans and each of them serve a different purpose and they are interlinked in a way, but uh, the idea that because you have a building plan, you don't need the sectional title plan, or if you have a sectional title plan, you don't need the site development plan is purely incorrect. And uh, you will not get far if you, if you try to use that logic. <clears throat> now, the first thing that we discussed is the uh, site development plan. And that is a legally required plan for complexes in terms of the town planning scheme that indicates the layout of the units, entrances, exits, parking requirements, uh, the floor space ratio, the coverage, all of those things. And the purpose of that plan is to give council the opportunity to make sure that because you're living in close proximity to your co-owners, uh, you are not inconveniencing your co-owners, uh, your uh, parking is uh, according to the town planning requirements, and um, it will also include things like stormwater plans and uh, so that is the basis of it. Before council can approve a building plan for a new complex, they will first have to approve a site development plan. It indicate garden areas, uh, things like that. And that becomes law. So any changes that you want to make in your complex need to be in according with the site development plan. And if you change that, uh, as in the example, this is the example where uh, uh, a LAPO and a carport was added. We first need to submit a site development plan to council and they will evaluate it and see if it is inconveniencing everybody. Is there any servitudes that is affected and things like that. Uh, so before we can deal with any other type of plan, we need to understand the site development plan that is a standard requirement for most, uh, for most uh, complexes. So you need your, um, your zoning certificate, check in there if it's a requirement. Even if it's not a requirement, council have the prerogative and they often would uh, request it that you submit a site development plan to council before they will consider building plans. Um, then building plans, 
what needs to be on a building plan and when do you need building plans? Now, typically any structure that is erected needs a building plan. Temporary structures as well as permanent structures from any material for accommodation or for, con or for convenience of humans or animals, any facilities or systems within or outside incidental to the building uh, for provision of water, draining, sewage, stormwater, electricity, all of those need building plans. In some council areas, there's some exemptions for minor building works. It's not applicable in Tswane and even in the municipalities where you can get exemption, you need to submit a building plan for them to give you exemption. So there's not really much, much in it. Uh, as far as my personal way of explaining it, anything that you can't pick up and put in your garage uh, needs a building plan. Um, any walls higher than one meter needs a building plan. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to understand that a lot of the issues that we uh, have is because people don't understand they need plans. Um, even inside changes, there's another story going around that inside changes don't need building plans. That's not correct you will appreciate that some walls inside your unit is load bearing. It is carrying the weight of the roof. And we have been involved in cases where walls have been removed, where the attitude was, it's mine, it's inside, I'll do what I want. And uh, by removing certain walls or portions of it, uh, you will damage the structure and we had a case where a roof collapsed basically because of that. And uh, from the managing agent side and the trustee side, you will know that when that happened, the problem becomes the problem of the body corporate because the roof belongs to the body corporate. Uh, and therefore it is important that the idea that inside changes don't need building plans and don't need permission um, should be done away with. Uh, really minor things, if you have an arch and you want to make it square, um, you know, I think things like that one can uh, close your eyes to. <coughs> but um, any changes to plumbing, if you convert, uh, if you change your bathroom and you change the position of the outlets, you need to submit new building plans. Um, so yeah, not only outside, but also inside, inside structures need, needs building plans. Now let's have a look at building plans and see the problem areas. Uh, firstly, a building plan uh, is only a valid approved building plan if it have a approved stamp on it. <coughs> um, there's different ways that council uh, present this. And sorry, let me just uh, get some water. <coughs> I think I have been talking too much lately, but let's carry on. We need a, a approved stamp on a plan. Um, and secondly, you need a building plan number. When we submit a plan to council, the first thing they do is they issue a building plan number and that uh, is used in future to refer to that plan and uh, even when we get to issues like uh, um, having uh, the building inspector come out to issue certificates of occupancy, they need the approved building plan and they will use the plan number to deal with the plan. Uh, a big issue that we often have with uh, property practitioners uh, where they would ask the seller 
if they have building plans and the owner will say yes, later on in the process when those plans need to be uh, handed over to the buyer, we find out that it is really a piece of A4 paper with some lines on it, no approval stamp, only half of the uh, structures is indicated and then at that point we need to start uh, submitting new uh, plans to council. It can take months to get building plans approved, especially now with the COVID situation. And uh, a lot of deals are being jeopardized because uh, the property practitioner does not insist on seeing the plans up front and making sure that it is valid that it is approved and that, um, that it uh, have all the structures on it. Uh, a building plan is, is required by council that, and it's each owner's responsibility to have a copy of a building plan. Uh, the site development plan that we refer to, that would be also the responsibility of the owner and in that case, the owner is the body corporate. So a body corporate should have a copy of the site development plan and each owner have the legal obligation to have a copy of a building plan. It is not muni the municipal uh, responsibility to keep copies. They do keep copies for one reason only, and that is to lose them. But if you can't find your plans at council, you have no case against council. Uh, it is each individual and the body corporate's responsibility to have the copies. If we can't prove plans is available and approved, we start from scratch. Council assume the site is vacant, we redraw all plans, we go and survey, and we submit new plans and you pay fees as if it is new. And therefore, it is important, and also for the managing agents, I know often when a new managing agent is appointed, the previous managing agent is not that happy, and uh, they will not uh, move all the information over to the new managing agent, but you are really doing huge damage to the complex if paperwork does not move from managing agent to managing agent and from buyer to seller. Uh, for the property practitioners as well, it is the new norm and it should always have been that way that no property is supposed to be sold without approved building plans and occupation certificates because you immediately make the new owner liable for those uh, documents. And uh, it can cost uh, quite a bit of money to replace these, and therefore it should form part of any transaction to move uh, building plans uh, from the seller to, to the buyer. The typical structures that we find that gives problems Firstly, we know carports. All carports need uh, building plans, even uh, carports with shade netting. Because you can't see through the shade netting from the top, it will be added as coverage, and therefore it needs to be indicated on a plan. <clears throat> Secondly, swimming pools. All swimming pools need building plans and it need to indicate the safety features uh, to prevent children from drowning. Um, a big issue in complexes is um, the um, opening and closing, the awnings that uh, can open and close. Lots of people say we don't need plans because they can open. Uh, council say you need plans because they can close. Um, another big issue is Wendy houses. A Wendy house always needs a building plan. And it is important to note that uh, the structures of Wendy houses are not suitable to live in. So you can never allow 
a structure like a Wendy to be used for accommodation. It's only approved for storage and it is, it can be quite expensive to get uh, Wendy's approved uh, in a complex purely because it is a fire hazard and often these Wendy's are placed in servitude areas. Um, so we often advise a seller uh, if there's no building plan uh, available that was already approved, often it's much cheaper to just uh, demolish the, the Wendy before you take any buyers to see it. Uh, because except for the fact that to get the plans approved uh, can be costly, often those Wendy's uh, are placed on common property and therefore does not really belong to the unit that you're selling. Um, so yeah, make sure when you deal with Wendy's for trustees, it is not a good policy to allow Wendy's. It was never supposed to be used for that. Complexes are not designed to accommodate Wendy's and it becomes a big risk for you, for the body corporate, as far as insurance is concerned, because it is not a structure that complies with uh, all fire regulations. And then the biggest problem that we deal with is LAPAS. LAPAS is really uh, a very complicated issue and so much more in complexes. Uh, they are fire hazards and they are often built over uh, municipal sewers, uh, servitude areas, and often they cannot be approved and a law can put a high risk on a com complex uh, and even the use of that is, is uh, problematic and the worst is where people build rise into them without any of the legal requirements to prevent fire and uh, we have been involved or in some cases where, where you'll have a fire in this and you can really, really um, bring the, the complex to its knees by allowing illegal LAPAS that does not conform to all the requirements. Again, for all of these structures, you need to submit building plans. And in that process, uh, the owner will be required to follow some steps and if the process is uh, done completely, you will get certificates of occupancy for those things where you can live in or that's used. And then you know the complex is safe. Up to that point, it is, it is quite risky. Um, let's just see. Okay. For every structure that you have, you also eventually needs a certificate of occupancy. As much as we said that building plans is vital, um, a building plan indicates what you plan to build. And what people plan to build and what they actually build is often not the same thing. So once you have erected the structure with the approved building plan, within one year, you need to get inspection by a building inspector and the purpose of that inspection would be a part of the process to obtain a certificate of occupancy. The building inspector will determine if the uh, structure conform with the building plan that was approved and therefore will uh, will comply with the national building regulations. Um, we often find that the person will submit a building plan of uh, addition to the kitchen or whatever, say of two by three meters. And when the builder is on site, they decide, oh, you know, while we're busy at it, let's, let's add something else to it, or let's make some changes 
uh, or we're not going to use the material as prescribed. A carport, you know, I can get it cheaper if I use a bit less steel. And, um, and then the, even though you might have a approved building plan, you will not uh, uh, get a certificate for it because it won't comply. And the purpose of building plans, occupation certificates is very simple. It is for the safety of the inhabitants. You can imagine if uh, you allow in a complex people to erect carports of substandard uh, or uh, uh, LAPAS that's not uh, fire uh, resistant or windy houses where electricity is connected to and uh, it's a place waiting, uh, accident waiting to happen, you are risking the lives and health of your co-owners and the members of, of the body corporate. And therefore, um, it is of vital importance that complexes comply uh, to all the rules and regulations. It might seem like it, have, it just have a big nuisance value, but really for all of these, uh, there is very good reasons why, why we need them. Um, okay, you see on the building plan, we said there's a building plan number, the certificate of occupancy will have the same plan number on it indicating that this plan, this building plan was used for the inspection. So only when you have a building plan, uh, occupation certificate, and there's no other structures on the property, you have a legal, uh, a legal uh, situation. Now, the, the third one uh, that you all, I think is fairly familiar with is, um, is uh, sectional title plans. Um, let me just admit more people. There we go. Um, sectional title plans, as we said, have to do with one thing only, and that is ownership. So although you have building plans, you have all the other plans, um, the sectional title plan, the purpose of it is to indicate ownership. Uh, this is a typical example. That's the aerial photograph. There will be a section or a unit indicated. And when we refer to, uh, to a section, a unit, that would be what, what we will talk, will talk about. So if you get a copy of the a section or title plan, and it is, of course, I don't even have to mention it, that every managing agent and every body corporate should have a copy of the sectional title plans available because that is the basis for so much things in the complex. Um, on the first page, it will give the uh, details of the, uh, of the complex. The second one will have the buildings. Now, often in a complex, there will be 10 buildings, but there will be 100 units because each building contains uh, contains uh, 100, uh, oh, 10 sections. Uh, and then the last page, the second last page, will obviously uh, indicate each section. And that is important to know. So all that you deal with basically when you sell a property uh, or when you buy it is basically the inside of, your, of, of the section. And then the last page, and that is uh, the important page, is um, where it will indicate uh, the section, it will give the square meterage, and it will give the participation quota. <clears throat> and as you all know, participation quota is used to determine uh, levies. And therefore, if the sectional title plans are not up to date, basically some owners will cross subsidize other owners. If one owner made an addition uh, that should be on the sectional title plan uh, and it's not done, all other people is subsidizing that owner. And therefore 
any structures that needs to be added needs to be added from the start and if you live in a complex where there is a lot of uh, of uh, illegal additions uh, basically you should uh, encourage the trustees to rectify these so that uh, levies are paid according to the uh, to all sectional title regulations. Um, just an a, a easy a way to, to show how it affects, uh, uh, addition can affect it. If we have 10 units, all of them 100 square meters, uh, all of them will pay the same amount. So if you need 10,000 Rand a month, each one will pay 1,000 Rand uh, but if one unit make an addition of 40 square meters, let's say uh, the garage was not part of the, uh, of, of the sectional title, it was common property or something, and the owner converts it for his own use, that will immediately change his floor area to 140 square meters and all of the others uh, will only have 9.55 left and he will have 14 to add up to the 100. So his uh, levy will increase by, by about 40% and the other owners will decrease. In a complex, you always have when one, when one uh, participation quota increase, the rest will decrease. And therefore, it is of utmost importance for, from a financial point of view to make sure that your sectional title plans are always up to date. Now, there were some questions on Spluma. Spluma basically uh, refers to national um, uh, land use uh, act. Uh, and in certain areas, in Mapumalanga, uh, things like building plans are a requirement before a property can transfer. There was lots of rumors that from October onwards in uh, all areas, you won't be able to do a transfer of a property without uh, having a Spluma certificate. That's not quite 100% accurate because each uh, town and city must have their own uh, bylaws. In Swane, we have one bylaw, uh, section 28.9, that determine whenever an extension uh, within a sectional title plan is, uh, scheme is done, we need to apply for, um, for a, a, it's not a Spluma certificate, it is permission in terms of section 28.9. So if any additions is done and this change is required, we first need to uh, apply for council for this. And in this process, council compare the sectional title plans with the building plans with the structures on the property. So although it's not Spluma related really, uh, council is using this to force sectional title owners and complexes to be legal. And uh, the process of rectifying building plans, sectional title plans, site development plans, obtaining a section 28.9 uh, permission can take you up to nine months or a year. And therefore it is of importance for trustees and owners to assist in the complex to make sure that the complex is legal. Um, there is some uh, complexes, a specific one I think about where uh, financial uh, institutions uh, refuse to give bonds because there are so many illegal stuff. And once a complex starts deteriorating and trustees don't have a firm hold on illegal structures and additions made, um, you really are not doing anybody a favor. Uh, everybody's value of their property is deteriorating and uh, cases where 20 or 30 years, very little was done by trustees 
it really becomes very difficult to convince owners then that they should be legal. And um, of course, council should uh, send out uh, inspectors on a regular basis to complexes. At this stage, they really only work on uh, uh, complaints. So if a owner would feel that his levy is affected by the fact that uh, sectional title plans are not up to date and there's illegal structures without building plans, the building inspector can issue and will issue uh, uh, to the owners uh, basically a, a letter stating that they have 28 days to fix it and otherwise they will be taken to court uh, and they can get fines and uh, council can even uh, demolish those structures uh, at the uh, cost of the complex eventually. So it's, it's not the route to go. <clears throat> okay, um, how we are involved in solving this is doing independent complex audits uh, we basically start with obtaining all the information, uh, existing building plans, the existing site development plans, and then we physically go out and survey the complex and we compare them with each other. And we give uh, a report to the, to the body corporate on how many uh, of these uh, units have illegal additions how many plans, building plans needs to be changed, how the sectional title plans need to be updated. It is unfortunately quite a, a, a technical thing and therefore uh, we advise that you get professional help in that. There's a lot of uh, additions that's done, especially things like closing of, uh, of areas behind units that can never be approved because they uh, enclose gullies. Uh, there's uh, carports that exceed the coverage. And uh, before you really know the legal status of your complex, it's very difficult to consider anything new because you don't know if there's, for instance, more coverage. So even giving somebody permission to put up a new carport that carport might have to be uh, demolished at some stage. And if you've given permission, uh, they can come back and say, but you gave permission, now you, now you tell us it must be demolished. Um, so yeah, make use of professionals when you deal with these type of things, at least get the proper information. Uh, personally, uh, I attend quite a lot of trustee meetings and uh, we attend uh, AGMs and special meetings because we realize that a lot of problems in complexes exist because owners and even trustees do not understand the basic concepts of sectional title when it comes to uh, structures and additions uh, that, that's, that's made. Now, just the typical uh, page from audit, we would give each owner uh, a four page indicating his unit, indicating mm -hmm. what's on the sectional title plans, and then uh, showing the trustees which uh, additions needs uh, to be uh, looked at. And uh, we will assist in advising if it should be included mm -hmm. in the participation mm -hmm. quota or should it be registered as exclusive use areas. Um, there's pros and cons to everything and eventually it is the responsibility of the body corporate to decide how they want to deal with these issues. Uh, to be fair to everybody because you cannot uh, give some people permission and some can't, you need to be consistent and um, uh, if you make the wrong decisions, it can, it can really negatively affect some owners unfairly. Um, and therefore, it's important to, to deal with them all at the same time. Um, as we said, per complex audit we do for each section, we do a unit. 
just to show you an example of one we did, um, all of the red and green in this complex is problematic, needs attention. Uh, we have a complex that we deal with with 32 units, 28 of them need attention. So this is a very common thing over the years. This has not been uh, kept up to date uh, and uh, a very Lysis fair attitude was uh, uh, used by trustees. And the problem is some of these problems was created 25 years ago by trustees. That is very long gone. Um, unfortunately, uh, council deal only with the existing owner. So if you bought into a unit or a complex that's illegal, you became part of that problem the moment that uh, the unit registered on your name. The same with building plans. Council only deal with the owner at the moment. If you bought it like that and your property practitioner didn't warn you about the dangers of buying a property without a, a building plan and a certificate of occupancy, you have bought that problem and now you're stuck with it and uh, uh, you will have to deal with it and more so now the banks often, as I said, don't want to give bonds on uh, sectional title units that is not up to date and we have lots of, uh, of uh, property practitioners in tears in our office because they did all the work. They have a buyer, they have a seller, but they can't do a deal because it will take months to rectify the, the, the problem. <clears throat> in the uh, audit, we will look at things like sewage as well. Um, Often the sewerage, main sewerage lines of council runs on one of the sides and any structures that's erected on over those uh, servitude areas needs to be demolished. We don't even have to try and get them approved. They will not get approved. Um, and unfortunately, especially LAPOS is often built in those areas. <clears throat> also stormwater. Um, we have a case now and I know you, you joined us for the meeting where we deal with the stormwater issue, where Luvadex was extended over a stormwater pipe. And we have been busy for, well, uh, the body corporate tried for about two years to rectify it. And I think we've been busy for a few months now with it. So it's really complicated, these issues where, um, where, where structures have been erected without following procedure. <clears throat> okay, let's quickly go back to our scenarios. The first one was uh, asking for permission for carports. Now, the first thing we need to consider is the area where the carport is going to be erected. Who does it belong to? And typically, it is common property. So to use common property for your own uh, needs, if you want to claim it for you, you obviously need to get permission from your co-owners and therefore you will need a special, uh, a special resolution basically. So it must at some stage go to a meeting and everybody must agree according to the required percentages that you can have, um, that, that you can use uh, common property to erect whatever you want to, to do for yourself. Secondly, you of course need to submit a revised site development plan where you, where council will, will see for instance, are there more coverage left? Can you add those square meterage to it? Then you of course need to get the uh, building plans approved for the carport. You will need the engineer to uh, sign off on your plans and then the building inspector will come and, uh, and inspect it because who said that you bought it according to the building plans? And then 
uh, with carports, it would normally be the best option to uh, register exclusive use areas. If you don't do that, the carport that you have paid for is for the convenience of any of the owners in the complex. The fact that you paid for it is very nice, but it's not yours. You cannot claim it. It is common property and any owner in the complex can use it. The same, uh, in the same way, when you sell a unit or buy a unit, you cannot go on the word of the owner that tells you there is my carport. Or the property practitioner or estate agent that say, this is yours, the garden is yours, there's your carport, because that is what the owner might tell you. But that is not necessarily the legal situation. You can only offer a buyer what legally can be proved. And therefore, taking the word of the owner is not good enough. You will run into problems at some stage. Make sure that you get the backing documents for it. Um, for exclusive use area, it will either be indicated on the sectional title plan, or it must be registered at CSOURCE with a plan indicating which areas are uh, allocated to which units. But if you can't find any of those documents, then often they don't exist and it's plain common property and uh, nobody can prevent somebody else from, <clears throat> from using it. The second uh, one we looked at, additions of a bedroom, that will also be including adding a kitchen, scullery, enclosing backyards, enclosing property, patios, all of those things. Um, you, of course, need to determine, again, uh, if there's a roof already, is it part of your section? Uh, if not, uh, of course, you, again, you're going to build onto common property. You need permission from, uh, from your co-owners. You need to uh, make sure if there's coverage available. And in that case, you need to do the extension of your section that will increase the PQ, that will increase your levy, that will decrease the levies of all other owners by a fraction. <clears throat> um, but that is the process that needs to be followed, except for all the other things we already mentioned, building plans, uh, occupation certificates, all of those things needs to be adhered to when you want to make an addition of a, like a, a structure that would only be used by you that's connected to the house and, uh, and even if it is a LARPA or whatever that's enclosed that you want to, to, to form part of your, your section. But in, in cases where it's possible to do exclusive use areas, as I said, for, for LARPAs, for carports, for garden areas, <clears throat> it, is, uh, it is mostly advisable to register exclusive use areas and not include it in the, in the PQ. And with exclusive use areas, there's lots of other issues that you need to, uh, to deal with in the complex. Who's going to do the maintenance? Uh, what do you do if the maintenance is not done? For instance, when exclusive use areas is registered, even the gardener of the complex is not allowed to enter without permission. So there's lots of details that, uh, that one needs to, to look at. Uh, we're running a bit out of time. I see there's quite a bit of people that would be interested in, in more, more info on um, Prop on uh, complex audits, uh, please send us a mail and we will be in touch with you. Uh, as I said, we, will, we can at attend a, a meeting or something and just explain in more detail because there's really lots of, of issues uh, surrounding that. Now, the third one that seems to be very straightforward, but that's not, is when uh, you want to convert garages always problematic for the one reason is that uh, those parking uh, 
area, the garage, form part of the minimum parking requirements for the complex. So any garage that is converted makes the uh, complex illegal as far as parking requirements is concerned. And therefore, if you want to do that, you of course need to follow all the other procedures, building plans and stuff, but you also need to find a way to provide the parking that you are now using for your own purposes. And you can't just say, okay, there is parking available. I'm going to park in front of my unit. I'm going to use the visitor's <laughs> parking. No, you forfeited the right to parking. So you must obtain either by buying a parking spaces, uh, op get away, and it must obviously be uh, possible to do it for all your owners, because if you allow it for one owner, uh, you will have to do it for everybody. So what happened if 50 units all decide to change their garages into, into uh, living areas, and you need to provide all of those parking? Typically, it's almost impossible to get it done, and it is not recommended that any permission is given for that. And um, I foresee that a lot that have been done already will have to be reconverted into uh, garages again. And again, if you bought a unit like that, uh, you, you bought a problem and it, it, it might come back to bite you. Okay, just back to the, the to end up with, Please, when uh, trustees give permission, the trustees have in principle no objection to additions or alterations on condition that the provisions of the Town Plan Scheme National Building Regulations and all the other acts are adhered to. Then the owner knows you don't give permission. You just say from the trustees' point of view, you have no problem, but that they must follow all the other stuff. Okay, the, the process is thus dealing, uh, when you want to, to do that, you must get approval from, the, from an AGM or a special meeting, you need building plans, you need the certificate of occupancy for the changes, you need to provide alternative parking, and you need to change the site development plan because those parking was indicated on the site development plan as your parking requirement. Problem structures in complexes, as we said, lapas, carports, enclosed patios, enclosed balconies. Remember, even a balcony is common property. Although it might sit on the first floor, if it's not part of your PQ, it's common property. So enclosing it will also change the PQ. It will also in, uh, change the visual um, look of the property. Um, then, of course, uh, splash pools, uh, enclosed, uh, uh, enclosed courtyards, windy houses, garages converted, and even garages used for storage. Garages are not allowed to be used for storage because it is set aside in the site development plan as, um, as parking. So we can't do that. Okay. I hope I have answered most of the questions. Um, Jenny, do you want to just give me the questions that, uh, that was asked already? Um, you can also see our um, email address if you want to send us an email, perhaps for interest in, uh, in a talk on the, um, uh, the inspections of the properties or uh, investigation. Um, Jenny, can you just unmute yourself and perhaps uh, yeah. ask? Well, we received quite a few questions. I think you've answered a lot of them in the presentation already. Uh, okay. What seems to be a common question is how do you enforce it? Uh, you've now bought a property. Uh, there's been changes. The one lady says it's, it looks terrible. There's no occupation certificate. How do we force the owner to change at this as per the plan? Okay. Uh, the first step is to, um, to take responsibility as trustees, to take the responsibility that it's your, you are the 
institution that is legally obliged to do that. We then recommend that uh, 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 AGM or a special meeting is held and that this is explained to owners and um, if, uh, if required that a uh, uh, complex audit is done and once you know what the problems are, the body corporate can come together and they can decide on the way forward. But you cannot leave that in the hands of, of the owners because obviously nobody wants to pay, nobody wants to make changes, nobody wants the PQs being rectified because it will cost them money. Um, it's a legal requirement. So the body corporate can insist on it. They can give them deadlines. Uh, the body corporate can even go so far to... Uh, to break down some of the structures at the cost of the owners. And in, uh, if, if that doesn't help, a, a building inspector can always be called and then it's done from municipality side. We don't recommend that. We first try to explain to owners what the dangers are for the complex and force them in a nice way, try to take them with in the process but you're always left with the option that if that doesn't work, you just ask a building inspector to come and do it and then the municipality take over. But then the whole complex is at risk uh, and then it's not at your time. Then it's at, at their time, the owners will be taken to court and, uh, and, and then uh, you get action uh, normally. But we try to prevent that because it's really inconvenient it can be costly and uh, we, we don't want to do that. But the risk to leave a complex is just high. Uh, and therefore, the ideal is whenever somebody starts making an addition, it should be stopped if it was not complied with. But as I said, over the years, we stuck with things that was done with the best of intentions by owners, with the consent of the trustees that they thought was the uh, authority to go to. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot was not done in bad intent, but it is a problem now and therefore we, we need to rectify it. Okay, and then the next one, does the term Wendy Houses include a child's Wendy House for playing in? It's 1.8 by 2.4. Uh, yes, it will include that if it's standard height and you can't, you, you can't put it in the garage, then it will definitely be. Uh, when the building inspector come out to inspect the property, if you can uh, hide it in the garage and he can't see it, you will get away with it. But if you can't move it, then it's a structure. And the height, the size of that will definitely constitute uh, a structure. Okay, do canvas awnings uh, for a shaded stoop need to be on a plan? Uh, the retractable ones, uh, if, if they don't uh, extend more than uh, a typical roof overhang, uh, or you can hide them, you can retract them, I think you will get away with it. If we do plans for the complex or there's other changes, we will put it on a plan. But if that's the only problem in a complex, I won't bother to submit a plan for that. You'll just uh, retract it when the building inspector is there. There's unfortunately some gray areas and different building inspectors have different opinions on it. Uh, but typically there's bigger problems than that. Okay. Is it the managing agent's responsibility to supply site plans to new owners? Uh, personally, I think uh, it is, if it's a responsibility, I don't know. I think if you really want to be a good managing agent and you want to stand out and you want to uh, prevent problems in future, uh, it is a very good idea. Uh, the same for uh, property practitioners to provide your buyers with all the management rules, conduct rules, plans, uh, um, sectional title plans, all of those plans, because then from the start, they know exactly what they are buying into. Uh, 
unfortunately, that's not happening. But I think the more professional we become or want to be, that is the type of things that uh, will uh, distinguish just another managing agent from an outstanding one. Uh, and in the long run, it will just become easier and easier to manage that complex. Uh, and that hasn't been happening often lately. Okay, and then uh, I think you answered it previously. What about owners who have unknowingly inherited an alteration done by a previous owner? Okay, unknowingly you have uh, got yourself into a problem. Uh, you should have had uh, advice from a, a property practitioner, but that also didn't happen much. Uh, so yes, unfortunately you bought the problem and the problem is now solely yours. Uh, if it needs to be demolished, you will be on the losing end. Uh, to Technically, you will have a claim against the seller, but in practice, the cost of that is, uh, is, is not making it possible or feasible. Uh, and therefore, we really try to prevent those type of things from happening in future by uh, rectifying these things so that when you sell your unit, the new buyer know that he, he gets what he bought as well as that he won't get a problem with the bank when he want to, uh, when, when he want to sell the unit. Or with some in future, if the Spluma regulations are changed, whereby you won't be able to sell a property without that, any property, it will again still become the problem of the existing owner. Okay. Can you please advise on solar panels as well? Uh, solar panels will also need, it will of course be erected on common property and therefore it will also need approval and it will uh, need to be approved by council as well. Uh, it will also affect the visual on, on the property and therefore it's ideal to have a policy uh, done by experts again, how to do it, uh, try to keep it uh, fairly uh, similar to, to others, have some standards, otherwise you will create a, a squatter camp and you will just uh, not have uh, you know the best interest of all the owners at heart it's also necessary to make sure that all owners can be accommodated in in the process um, you know if you have like units on the bottom and at the top you cannot say okay because you have a top unit you can have a uh, a, a solar geyser, but the, the guys at the bottom, you can't have it. Uh, those uh, panels will go onto common property and you need to, to understand the consequences of, of that. Um, and it is the thing of the future. So we can't just say, oh, we don't want it. Uh, we need to find uh, professional solutions to deal with it. Okay, I think we on to our last one, Aubrey, because we're running a bit late. Should a managing agent include a warning of illegal additions or non-compliance with regulations of a unit on a clearance certificate for sale? Um, I don't think it's a legal requirement to do it. But again, I think it is the right thing to do uh, to prevent the, the situation where problems is just moved on from one owner to the next. Uh, the more we can do to bring the reality to the industry, I think the sooner we will start to sort this and, and prevent uh, the situation that, that we ended ourselves into. But that's a personal opinion for me because I'm passionate about not putting buyers into a situation where they don't deserve to be uh, while there is professional people involved, including the managing agents, including the property practitioners, including the conveyances, uh, between all of those, we, we, we manage to move 
a problem to a new buyer uh, and I don't feel that is the correct way to do it. Any more questions? We can squeeze one more in. Can a property be transferred without a clearance certificate? Uh, as far as I know, not. It's not really part of, of the town planning issues, but uh, my experience is that that is a legal requirement for the, for the transfer. Perfect. That's all. Thank you, Aubrey. Okay. Sorry for running late. I sometimes get carried away a bit and there's so much information. If you want uh, more presentations on specific issues, you're welcome to send Jenny a, a, a mail. Just ask them and we can even have short ones on just specific issues. Or if you have a specific uh, issue in your complex, you're welcome to contact us and uh, we will see how we can assist you. Thank you for joining us and have a lovely day. And I hope that the information was of value to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>